If you have clicked on this video expecting to hear a story of crafting and triumph, I am sorry to inform you that is not what it contains. The next few minutes are full only of misery, hardship, and woe. But if you are looking for a tale of doors fashioned from strange findings, unusual roofs, and houses with legs stolen from arachnids, perhaps you may lend just a bit of your time. This tale begins much like any other, with a girl and a very unfortunate idea. If you're like me, you probably grew up reading series of unfortunate events. This is gonna be a little bit controversial, but I actually do prefer the film version. I know the Netflix series was more true to the books, but I do think that the movie was a little bit more well designed, personally. The part of the movie with the sanctuary is a word which here means a small safe place in a troubling world. It gets me every time. They used a lot more practical effects in the movie and they used matte paintings instead of green screen. We are making a miniature version of Aunt Josephine's house complete with Cliff. To decide the scale for this project, I had to decide what I was gonna use as a base. I decided to use the lid that I had left over from the Spirited Away cookie tin. I drew out the bottom of the house shape on a piece of cardboard. Wait, start. This house has the most complicated shape of anything that I've made thus far. I really had to break down all the shapes and just kind of tackle them separately to make it a little bit more manageable. I say manageable when I'm here like over a month later <laughs> working on this. There's sort of three sections to the house, the front, the middle and the back. I started off with the middle piece just because it was the most regularly shaped. So I cut the middle wall pieces out of paperboard, cut out all of the windows on the two side walls. I started layering on texturing details and like siding. It's just a horizontal line straight across basically. Cardstock is really nice because it's super thin and you can lay it over each other. I created frames for the windows with paperboard. We needed to make sure that the house is as light as possible because it's going to attach the top of the cliff. Now I really wanted to make the inside of the house as simple as possible, but that didn't really go as planned. I did quite a lot of work on the inside, probably way too much. The two inside walls were rectangles with triangles at the top, you know, kind of like a normal house shape. There are several different window details on the two walls above the doorways. I just cut out that piece, laid on plastic for that, drawing what the piece should look like and then just cutting it out from there. A very scientific process here. Well, I went ahead and did Ike's room. The wall with the window textured the outside of that with the same siding method, layering on cardstock, but I kept them long because I knew that that was gonna need to continue on the side walls so that I could wrap it around later. I added a circular frame for Ike's window. I did layer on some texture for the flooring. Essentially, I just cut strips to different sizes to lay on like a floor. Went on the other side of the base cardboard, textured the bottom of that as well. I moved to the back room to start making those walls. The front and the back rooms were a lot harder to make the shapes of for the walls because they sort of curve and then go straight up at the top. So to create that shape, I marked where the top was gonna be and then folded it over a ruler. I'm gonna trace this before I actually try to cut it out because this could be a disaster, let's be real. I went ahead and cut the frame for the eye window, drawing the shape out and then doing my best to cut as thin as possible while also making sure that it stayed intact. Painted the window frame, weathered it a little bit before the plastic was added. I did as much work on pieces before I attached them because it's a lot easier easier to work with them. And there was a lot of molding, wainscoting kind of details. I just went in with a light yellowish color, painted on the patterns of the panes of the windows and the grid accent details over the doorways. If you're not that great at this, you can use scrape it off. So I painted the inside walls. They were sort of a light blue grayish color. And I can't remember much more, but I know it happened. Quiet. So quiet. I painted the floor as well. This is the problem. Why am I putting this much effort into this flooring when you probably will not see hardly any of it? Now underneath the house, it is kind of held up by these two layers of wooden beams. I just cut strips of foam core, attached them in a grid. I thought it would be easier to attach them beforehand. As much as it was, I also had to fix it later, so. 
Luckily, these bottom pieces were not difficult to take off because I put one too many. Then it comes to the part that always makes me so nervous. If there's anyone else out there that puts off attaching things to the model in the fear that they will complicate things later and ends up hindering progress. There are two kinds of fears, rational and irrational. Before I put Ike's room in, I needed to put it together, wrapped those siding pieces around to continue the texture onto those two walls, painted on the panes. I then, of course, just randomly decided that I needed to add some of the little props. It was so unnecessary. All those tiny papers and photos hanging on the walls. I used a scrap from my Victorian letters, drew some little designs on them, some maps, things like that that are in the room. Either you can see or I can see. We can't both see at the same time. And then I also went in with some thread and stuck a bunch of them to it so that you could see it in the window. It's very old. Somebody tell me why I'm doing this. Will you see it in the final result? Probably not. You're seeing it now, so at least you and me know. Then I started tackling the back room, attaching it together. I don't take any risks in life. This is about as dangerous as I get. The good news is that I didn't have to do it perfectly because I was going to texture those walls later. And the texture hides all sins. <laughs> It's fine. We'll just glue this on and then if it makes our life harder, it just does and we just have to figure it out. I am both chronically indecisive and work best Is with a, a solid topic? plan, which are two traits that do not mix well. I textured the inside of those walls. You've already seen this like a hundred times, so. Added a door as well to Ike's room so that you're even less likely to see the details that I made inside. I added a bottom trim on the base of the house. The back eye window is sort of inset to the house. So there's kind of a little ledge at the bottom. Essentially, I just cut a little strip of paperboard and laid that on the perimeter of the window. Then I started adding some of the outer details on the house, the beams in between each section of two windows on the side walls. I used foam core again, just cut a strip of it in half so that it wouldn't be as thick and glued them in between. Then I started working on the front of the house, I think was actually the most difficult. The front doorway is inset into the house. The same idea as the back window. Two separate wall pieces that sort of attach to each other. The front doorway has a door, two windows on the side, and one over the top. Everything needs to be painted before it goes in just because it's so much easier to paint when it's a separate piece, especially with something this small. The door is red on the outside of the house and it's that yellow, the same color as all the trim and stuff on the inside of the house. I also went in had to paint the panes of the two side windows and the top window, which essentially were just lines on this, so that was a little bit easier. Two side windows did have curtains on them and I decided I needed to make them. So I cut a strip of tissue paper and then started creating floral pattern. Then I folded those up accordion style and attached it onto each of the side windows. So with this front piece, I did the same thing as I did with Ike's room where I knew that the texture would need to wrap around. I'm just gonna feed, hopefully, this through the other hole in the front and then continue it around. Then I needed a little break from the house, so I started the cliff. It's very much the same way that I did both my snake den miniature and the hobbit hole. This would be so much easier with foam, but I don't have foam, so as always, we're gluing a bunch of cardboard together and paper mache. First, I needed to create the height of the cliff. It was at this point that I realized the cliff would need to be huge for the <laughs> scale of the house. Uh, I didn't want the cliff to be any taller than a lamp because I thought that would be excessive. Small cliff, giant house. It's fine. We might be in trouble. So I built up a vague cliff shape onto the cookie tin lid base. Ugh. If you have not seen some of the other videos that I have done, I feel like this might not make any sense at all. I need to really create some different jutting out areas so that it looked more like rocks. I'm just gluing trash together, believe me. I know. You may know what's coming next. We're crumpling up some foil and tried to create some vaguely rocky shapes. Probably could have done a lot more of this and it would have looked more like the one in the movie, but believe me, it'll be a cliff in the end. At least kinda. We're going in with our flour and water mixture. So I just went around the entire cliff, put strips of newspaper on. I also did the bottom of the tin as well. We will make that into part of the lake later. Now, in order to make it look like rock, I did have to go in 
after it dried. Do a layer on top of that with the same paper mache mixture. You can add a lot of different textural effects with the shapes and contours of the existing forms. Stippled it on with a brush, built up some areas, had less in some areas, and also just drew out some different rocky sort of lines and stuff, just trying to create more texture. And as that is drying, it's time to start texturing the back and the front of the house. Now there are actually two versions of the house. They used a combination of models and a built set, especially in the room with the back window. The set that was built does not match the model. We're just gonna pick and choose the pieces that we like and make our model based on that. The model has the same sort of haphazard shingles as the rest of the roof does. We're gonna create some of those shingles. So I went in with cardstock strips, cut them a little bit wider than I wanted the shingles to be, trimmed out different lengths and shapes for the shingles on the bottom. You don't cut it all the way up, you just cut most of the way up so the shingles look individually placed, but they're still attached on the top so it's easier to actually put onto the model. There are some areas that need individual shingles placed on, like at the very top of each of the areas so that you won't see the strip connecting them. I actually do really enjoy layering on textures like this. Over the back window, there's like a visor, I would call it, an overhanging part of the house. Now I went ahead and laid all the shingle strips on. So anywhere I see gaps. I'm just gonna put little single shingles and fill it in. Where are all my single shingles out there? <laughs> there is also one of those little visor sort of overhang pieces over the front door, so I attached that with paperboard. The shingle strips, I laid them on, overlapping them over each other, of course. And then for the borders and like the corners, I'm taking this string, and it's too thick like this, so I'm just gonna unravel them, coat it. I needed something that was gonna be flexible, glue that on on like, the edges. I had two Two different variations of string unraveled a piece of yarn and that has really thin strings. There's quite a lot on the front of the house. A curve shape over the door, down the sides, all has borders. <laughs> Top roof on the very front of the house has a couple of little window areas, so I had to create those with paperboard, cut out the window shapes, again, attach the plastic to it, paint on the panes, all those things, texture those. I laid on all the shingle patterns for the front roofs. Here's what the roof looks like. Start gluing it on. Pretty much all the roof sections have a flat part and then a various amount of different shapes that slope up to that. I cut the roof bases out of paperboard. I did a lot of the details before I attached it on. The middle roof does have a, another section. So of course they need to have as many complicated shapes as possible. But before we attach that on, I need to cut out the area. I went ahead and textured all that first, painted on all the window panes, added all the siding, and then I attached those on. It has a couple of sections that are sloping down and then it has a flat roof. The back roof kind of looks like a boat. It has a center with a boat sort of shape and then the roof sort of slopes up to that. It has a wooden planked top. I continued the shingles from the visor part of the roof up. The back roof does have the siding texture sort of and then the rest of the roofs all have the asymmetrical jagged shingle pattern. I did some of the border details in a lot of the different corners where the roof pieces meet each other on the top of Ike's roof. Just like on the outside of the house, there are support beams. So I went ahead and added those in with foam core again. I also continued the side beams up onto the roof overhang. The proportions completely off, but you know what? We're getting there. There is also a chimney on the back side of the house. So I went ahead and started creating that. I made the shape out of paperboard. Top has a sort of circular pipe looking thing. So I used a bead to create that. Went in with my paper mache liquid and created the stone texture, drawing out all the stone pattern on the outside. I attached the chimney onto the roof, added the pipe detail on the other side of the house. I used a twist tie, I found a round one, bent that into the shape, cut it to size, glued it on there, and created the little pieces holding it on with cardstock. Arguably one of the most difficult parts of this project, decorative fence that's on the top of the roof. I took a matchstick, cut it into the tiniest pieces I possibly could. <laughs> Glued all of them on in hopefully equal distances from each other. I uh, didn't cut it very evenly. <sighs> So I'm gonna add the little top trim here. After all the wooden pieces for the fence were on, I went in with two pieces of thread and created horizontal rows going all the way around it. This isn't exactly how the fence is because it's way more decorative, but it was time to paint, which is the fun part. I started out with the airbrush to paint 
that fence a really dark gray. You know, I just get like trigger happy and I just wanna like do everything. Did a base layer for the cliff. Basically, I'm just painting it mostly black. Now I'm going to go in and try and do some of the shadows and highlighting. So I'm gonna make darker the more sunken back areas and start trying to separate some of the separate rocks. Starting to kind of layer in some of the highlights and shadows. So I'm really gonna try and bring out some of this texture by dry brushing. Well, I tried to add detail to the cliff by creating those highlights and shadows, create each individual rock shape a little bit more. And then when I went down to do the lake at the bottom as well, I wanted to stick a lot with the same colors, but I did add just a little bit of blue to make some differentiation. Just making a really subtle gradient, lighter closer to the cliff, darker outside. This is one of the first projects where it's like essentially done. I still really haven't painted it at all. So I'm sure it will have a pretty dramatic transformation. For me, for painting, there's like three steps. So there's doing the base color, creating highlights and shadows, and then weathering everything. I feel like my color scheme was like pretty off because because it was a little different in every shot. Any color that I went in with here, I just at least mixed with a little bit of black to make it kind of muddy, dull, worn down, unfortunate. <laughs> painted big sections first, and then I went on and painted the details after. And to create any kind of wood texturing, I just dry brushed a lot of it on. Then I had to go and paint in a lot of the trim details after everything for the bigger wall sections was done. I started layering on some shadows that go between the rows of shingles to really start dividing them up a little bit. I also painted the back roof light bluish underneath the house with the beams dry brushing both super light gray and some darker gray to try and create that texture of the wood. For weathering, I used the sponge brush a lot because it does create that really interesting texture if you don't have a lot of paint on it. Stipple on. Did that for a lot of like the roof details, painting like trim, a bunch of the window frames, beams, a pipe, all the little detail areas. Let's just take off and have some fun. There's not one good thing about your sweetheart. There's not one good thing about you, baby. You're the most vicious, venomous snake around. You've got no drop of love or care. You are misery's despair. Why it burn the world and make us all just stare? I did create some rusty sort of areas on the back roof. I also decided to flip up and bend some of the roof shingles. Painted rust coming down where the beams meet the roof. On the side of the house with the chimney, there are also these two little pieces of wood. I painted it like a brownish gray color and just stuck those on. Then I needed to really create that water at the bottom. I really debated for a long time what I was gonna do this with because I don't have resin. There's always something. I thought that I could use a sheet from a plastic food container. I cut the piece that it would fit in, mod podge that down onto the surface of the base. It went better than expected. I think it's gonna work. Blend in some of the edges of this with some hot glue. Now this is a pretty specific solution just because I knew also that I was going to be covering a lot of these edges. Now at the base of the cliff, I needed some weight to counterbalance where the house would be at the top of the cliff so that it wouldn't just top over. Dry brushed the rocks black so that they would blend into the cliff, laid them out, tried to put them in areas where they sort of naturally blended in with the rest of the cliff. Wanted to make some little leeches in the lake. It's the leeches! I made those out of Sculpey. Super simple. It's pretty self-explanatory. The same thing that I did in my Snake Den miniature. Painted all of them black. Sneak some of them under the surface of the plastic so it would look like they were under the water. And then some of them were on the top. Then we need to create the surface of the water. Mod Podge the top of it. Well, it'd be great if I had glossy Mod Podge, but I don't. So I think it'll be just fine. And we're gonna become airbender. And used air to blow it towards the cliff where the waves would be headed. Up some of the rocks to add that gloss where the water has been hitting them. Now the leeches are gonna be just slightly different. There's gonna be more roughness where they're biting. Stipple some more texture on there. After that had dried, I went in with white paint on the sort of crests of where the waves are near rocks and the cliffs also around the eels. Then we had to, of course, attach the house onto the cliff. Depending on where you look at in the film, either the entire house is off the cliff or the front of the house is attached to the cliff and the rest of it is just because of the scale and, you know, 
gravity. I decided to have the front of the house be the attach point to the cliff and not have the whole thing off. It really looks like an optical illusion. Then I needed to add on all of the support beams that are jutting out from the cliff. So for this I used popsicle sticks, cut thin strips of them, I painted them gray, supported by a very precarious pile of various craft supplies, much like my life. Hot glued all these support sticks on. I started with the longer ones and just worked smaller um, across. Very haphazard, much like most of the things in this project. Then I had to create the front steps. I did that with styrofoam, a sort of half oval shape with some steps. Then I needed to paint the top of that, and luckily the texture of the styrofoam was perfect for that, and it really created that stone feel. There's just like a railing around the landing of the steps. Create that with some thin wire stuck each little prong into the styrofoam, and then I had to make the railing. This was super difficult. <laughs> then I had to work and finish off the top of the cliff. To break up the flat surface, there are basically just cracked rock formations, so I went in with my paper mache material, built up some areas, and carved out some of those cracked areas. After that dried, I went ahead and painted that, painted in the crack details, made as many different rock texture details as I could. Now there's also a small portion of the road. I say road as if it's like paved, but it's just a bunch of stones. So to create that texture, I did just layer on some dirt and then stipple painted on some different shades of gray and black. This only you know, but in the on either side of the door, there are also dead tree things. <laughs> the dollar store reindeer moss coming in to save us again. It had a very similar shape. Painted a couple small pieces of that black and just glued them on either side of the door. I laid on some different moss areas, added some really small pieces of rocks. With those final details, we were finally done. So here is Aunt Josephine's house, complete with a very wide window. easily the hardest project that I've done. It's a very odd shaped house. Definitely a super well designed piece of like set design, but man, was it really difficult. <laughs> I will be completely honest with you. It was pretty difficult to get myself to finish it sometimes. That being said, it might be one of my favorite projects that I've done so far. I'm a little bit upset about the scale. I really hope that I did it justice. It's one of my favorite movies just as far as design goes. So my style, it would just be a dream to work on something. Gothic magical realism. Let me know what your favorite book is. I was gonna say, let me know if you liked the movie or the series better, but honestly, I really don't wanna start that conversation. Please don't. Let me know if you're hiding a tattoo of an eye on your ankle so I can avoid you. But if anybody does make this or something else from the series, send me your projects. I would love to see any of them, <laughs> please. And if you already have, thank you. Your projects are all beautiful.